Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this season's first Bookends Book Club. I'm Jennifer Solheim, the Associate Director of the Bookends Novel Revision Fellowship, part of the Liechtenstein Center at Stony Brook University. Bookends was founded in 2017 by co-directors Susan Scarf Merrill and Meg Wolitzer with the aim of supporting writers in polishing their novels for readership. Tonight we're featuring a 2021 Bookends Fellow and a graduate of Stony Brook's MFA in Creative Writing and Literature. I'm so delighted to introduce Nora Dechter, a writer and teacher living on Treaty One territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Her first novel, How Far We Go and How Fast, won the 2019 Kobo Emerging Writer Award. Her second novel, What's Not Mine, the focus of our discussion this evening, was published this week by ECW Press. In conversation with Nora is her bookends mentor and program co-founding director, Susan Scarf Merrill most recently author of Shirley, a novel, which became a major motion picture starring Elizabeth Moss and Michael Stuhlbarg. She teaches in the MFA in Creative Writing and Literature at Stony Brook University. Following Nora and Susie's conversation, along with a reading from Nora, there will be plenty of time for questions, so don't hesitate to join in the conversation through the chat feature below, where you will also find a link to order What's Not Mine. Thank you so much for being here tonight and welcome Nora and Susie. I'm so happy to be here with you, Nora. I can't, I can't tell you. It's just a, a, a really wonderful moment in a long and wonderful and really great relationship that I have enjoyed so much. And I um I was thinking today about I've been sort of uh, going back through various conversations that we've had over the years and um, and looking at some of your interviews and something that you had said recently uh, in a conversation with your bookends pod mate Rachel Leon was uh, I have an extremely high tolerance for ambiguity in writing sometimes too high. I love nothing more than a line that can be read in more than one way. And as I've been thinking about you, you know, today with great intensity, I think about how true this rings for me that your characters embody real human contradiction and your sentences embody emotional ambiguity. And they're both the highest forms of the art of the novel to my mind. And I'm just so proud to be here with you and be part of your journey. So I wanted to start by saying that and then start hitting you with questions. Oh, thank you, you. Um, you said in that interview that you like writing that feels like an emergency. And I really, I love that. And I think it's something that you accomplish with real ease. And I, I know you and I know how hard you work. And I wonder when you're going for that emergency note, you know, if you're primarily thinking about voice or plot, or if you're writing, as I sometimes suspect, in a sort of a fugue state. <laughs> um, well, it's so lovely to be here. Um, it feels like coming home, which maybe makes sense because I'm on my couch in my living room. But um, <laughs> yeah, like after my book came out a week ago, and uh, after doing interviews and press like this it's just so lovely to be here um yeah writing that feels like an emergency um I think that I uh yeah I like that urgency um and in terms of like what comes first it's so hard to like uh, grasp onto but I think it's voice um so it's something kind of ephemeral or or maybe sometimes even tone or like atmosphere, which is even more annoying. <laughs> so it's not, yeah, not like a premise or anything like that, but like a feeling. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think you might be right. But yeah, it's sort of like, um, and this sounds so hokey, but like, like a channeling kind of thing, you know? Um, yeah. And then everything else comes and then I might do research and then plot work comes. But yeah, at first it is this like, feeling that can't be denied that makes me start writing something yeah I mean there really is this kind of um 
magical tone, you know, and that that it does feel as if you've heard and and um, sort of been given your characters in some way. There's there's a kind of a I, we were joking about this yesterday. There's a kind of effortlessness to your prose on the page. And again, it's funny to me because I do know you work extremely hard, but the end result really does feel as if you just went, oh, I think I'll write a book tomorrow, <laughs> you know, so um, so one of the, I think, most unusual things about your work is that you write in a space that looks young. You know, you, you're sort of, you're writing almost YA, but not at all. So your characters are young, their dilemmas are, uh, the dilemmas of their age, despite their intensity, but like Huck Finn or a member of the wedding or, um, or uh, Russell Russell Banks's Rule of the Bone, your your audience is adult, do you know, or primary. It seems to me really must be almost completely adult. And I've wondered a lot over the years how you pull this off, like what um, what you're doing to adultify these young stories. I, I don't know if it's something I've entirely figured out yet. Um, like for context, this is my second book. My first book was my MFA thesis. And I had decided kind of like as a personal challenge to try and write a YA book. I was just like, maybe I can do it, surely. And maybe a little flippantly, I was like, it'll be easy, you know? <laughs> um, and then when it came time to, I'd worked on it for years, came time to send it out. I was like, well, I will send it to YA publishers and see what happens, see if I'm told that it like rebuked and it's not YA. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, and it was published as YA. And it was sort of like stamped literary YA, which is like subgenre. <laughs> yeah. And then it won, um, like I, I was super excited. I'm, I'm Canadian. It won um, like one of the first novel sort of like national awards here, just in like general literary fiction. So like kind of, um, sealing the deal on it being like a bit crossover and there's not that much difference there's a little different between my first book and my second book in my second book I was like I would really like to see um when it became clear it was it was again a first person young female narrator um I would like to see if I can publish this as adult adult fiction for me categories are like a little tedious um but I'm a writer not a publisher and I think so I certainly think that like in the Venn diagram of YA, literary YA versus like adult fiction that um, centers on like a young person, there's a lot of crossover where very little is different. However, um, like when I read YA, which um, I, I just do from time to time, it's not like my um, sweet spot in terms of reading, but I read like a little bit of everything. I think there was a point in time where um, I remember shopping this book around after bookends to agents and asking one agent like who had didn't sign me but had engaged me in dialogue like do you think this is YA or or adult lit because I'd like it to be adult and she was like oh you're definitely writing about adult themes but I don't think it's themes because when you look at YA a lot of the darkest stuff in the world is there the last YA book I, re I read was um kind of racy in terms of the sex scenes, like mm -hmm. way more basic than anything I write, um, almost bordering on kinky. And uh, so it's not that, which leads me to think that it comes down to style. So mm -hmm. I think maybe there is like slightly more attention, slightly more like liberty to books that are gonna like cross over in, in the adult lit direction, whether they're published as such or they are published as like literary YA, but then are read by adults. So more attention to voice, more attention to style. And then the plots can be like relatively the same. Um, I think with my first book, if I was gonna try and publish it as, as not YA, all I would have to do would be make make like one plot point, like 10% less Hollywood and conventional, just like a little dial up that ambiguity that I love so much. Um, and then, yeah, like um, I got a few comments in the editorial process of like um, this, like 
this like 25 cent word could be like a 10 cent word. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) No, you you have expensive words. They're really good. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, I don't think there's, I think there's not that much difference in some ways, but then, yeah, there's like just shades of gray and what like makes it pushed over into adult lit. Okay, yeah. I mean, I think this might be a nice time to hear a little bit from the book because we've talked about what it sounds like and let's now hear it. Okay, well, I have it right here. Um, I'm going to read just a short section from the beginning of chapter two. So um, this book centers around, I'll just very briefly set it up, but um, it centers around uh, almost 16-year-old narrator Bria Powers um, having a strange and sort of sinister summer. Uh, And she is living kind of a double life. And the nighttime part of that double life involves um, a much older boyfriend. So this section kind of introduces him uh, and she calls him some boy. So how does it start like this? I'm seeing somebody, some boy. He has me in his phone under new thing, not even capitalized. That's all right, though, because I put him in mind under some boy. As in, someday some boy might need a more distinguishing moniker, but not yet. Not now. No. I meet some boy at the bar. All stars. I go there when my teeth have that feeling they need something to sink into. I have this thing now where I need it out at night. In day we stay in, undercover, playing with children, safe with my mind full up of what I want and none of the other stuff. Some boy says the more sex you have, the more you need it. So I wouldn't understand and should just let him. Some boy says a lot of things. What he doesn't know is I do understand. I've done more than he will ever know and I've seen all kinds of things without even trying. I'm seeing some boy and some boy sees me the way I want him to. Sees me show up with the night all over me, not asking for shit and not answering for it either. Sees me show up easy, eat pizza afterwards, and head home, giving away nothing of myself. Because I know him like he thinks he knows me. I know better than better. I know best. Some boy mutters nonsense in his sleep. I stay up late to read into it. Sometimes he says the strangest things in a pleading tone. Cheese balls, he begs of me. Sometimes he's upset and says no like you say it to make someone stop. I mutter back whatever words I feel like saying credenza, will you or won't you, bechamel. I like words, saying them and not saying them, using them to get things, like what I want. What, says some boy, stirring. Shh, I go. Because of the lay of the land and the way our township works, you see strangers all the time, but also word gets around. Words matter. The ones you put on a person can change who they are or who they think they are which is what counts. Love it. (laughs) It's just, it's so wonderful. And I, you know, listening to you, I, I, I I think there's something in Bria's um, consciousness, which is not Y, but A, Mm -hmm. you know, and maybe that's what it is. I mean, I, I don't know, but there are so many wonderful details in that section and you know in every section of the book but so many uh wonderful moments of building um against building so the name against the name the words against the muttering in the sleep and and um it's almost as if every uh every small section has a little arc of it of its own and completion and they're they're just continual moments of um of those gas stations that uh that uh, i think george saunders talks about where you hit something and you go oh i've arrived but no i have not um so a a follow-up to um to what you just read um addiction poor parenting parenting maybe not parenting poverty um uh a, your characters have really gritty lives and um and you get in so close and true with them and i wonder if working in this space is a comfort to you or a discomfort i wonder 
um, uh, I just wonder how it feels to be in this space because as you know as I think I've said before I think that plotting seems very easy for you You'd st the mechanics of story are quite um, are, are quite natural to you but that um, the dynamic of characters and story movement in terms of character I wonder if that place is a hard place to be and how you think about that and how you protect yourself? I think it's both, like a lot of things, like a comfort and a challenge. Um, it's certainly intense, like um, not to get too like highfalutin about my process, but it does sometimes feel like character acting almost, you know, like where I only can stay in tune with what my characters are going through if I have something in common with them, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it can be, yeah, it can be really like sort of psychologically perplexing to be like turning over that stuff in my head, but it's so fruitful in terms of the work that it like balances out, you know? So yeah, I, I find um, even though I have mostly only, only write fiction, that it only takes hold and takes off when I understand what I'm mining from my own personal experience, even if it's just like an undercurrent that flows through the story. So yeah, it's not like, it's not like I feel like I'm living in like the most traumatic moments of my life or my character's life when I'm working on things. Just like I can, again, I, I trust everyone here as a writer, so they won't think that I'm <laughs> hippy dippy here, but I can almost imagine like, <laughs> I can almost imagine like a river that I'm like sort of like dipping my toes into and then I can like feel what they're feeling but I can take them out at the same time you know that you know what I think you just explained something to me about you which is how you kind of inhabit the slightly numb space of trauma without um emoting excessively in it, you know, your your characters, you somehow manage to communicate a huge amount of emotion without ever using the terminology of emotion. And I think maybe what you just said is is how you do it. Does that make sense to you? It does. Yeah, I've always been really interested in that alchemy of like emotion into words, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't feel traumatic, it feels more productive for the most part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting to me. I um, I wonder because I know the other section that you might read is really a section where you go from the, um, the sort of stage setting to the particular, which is another thing I think you are really good at. And um, I wonder if before you read this section, you might just talk a little bit about uh, that idea of place and and place as character which i think this section really illuminates even though it's not about the specifics of um what things look like it's about what things are like um yeah so like apart from the voice or like tone or atmosphere that i talked about meeting i think setting is another thing that i need before i can really like hit the ground running um yeah it just like sort of fleshes out my imagination. Um, and I also mostly write in uh, first person present tense, which is intense. Um, so anytime you're like pulling back to look at like the community or something in a larger sort of like, um, like a wider frame, it feels like a nice relief and a nice contrast to that super internal stuff. So I do take pleasure for like myself and flexing my writing muscles, but also for like my characters because it gets exhaustive. I think being like stream of consciousness, close narrative distance, first person point of view. Um, but yeah, I find setting super inspirational also. Yeah. You want me to read that section? Yeah, please. Cause I really, um, I just, I love how this appears to be super straightforward and is actually so dynamic and rich and beautiful. So um, okay, so this is also from chapter two, just a little while later, and um, it's Bria, our narrator, describing um, sort of the season that her town of Beauchamp is in. 
Then there's the other thing about this summer or this year overall, I guess. And that's the fact that people keep dying. Well, not always permanently, but it's clear there is poison in the well, which is to say the drug supply. Every few seasons, the trend shifts. This year, pills are in fashion. Pressed ones, fake perks that are actually fentanyl, which is strong to make you feel good, but it's too strong. So you feel so good, you forget to breathe. First, there were the boys. Anthony McDonald, son of someone Tash knows, OD'd in his car in the parking lot behind the church on 5th Street on a Tuesday night in February. He was blue by the time the custodian found him and not from the cold. Then Tyler Fournier and Mike Bell on the same night separately in early spring. It hit the news then and everyone at school started talking about it, having heard detailed accounts from older brothers and sisters who knew the guys. They brought in a public health nurse from the city who did a talk in the school gym about the dangers of fentanyl. How these pills weren't like the Percocets and Oxys that people were used to, but they had higher concentrations because they weren't professionally manufactured, so you never really knew how much you were taking or what you were taking. She showed us one of those kits they were hanging out at the drugstore to reverse overdoses, and we all got one to take home. Then a couple from Durham died. Two real estate agents with their faces on benches who wanted to cut loose one weekend with some MDMA that wasn't what they thought it was. That was the peak. Everyone talked about nothing else and then it died down. Like maybe the pills weren't so strong anymore or their, else, their users had figured out how to take them safely. Then stuff happened. It's just, wow. Yeah. And stuff happening is a, a big deal in this story. <laughs> So, and I love how lightly you land on something that uh, is going to really matter to us. So it's just great. So, um, so I have two more general questions uh, and then we'll open up for um, other, the other peoples. But my first question is, what do you like to read? Are you still, I mean, I, I'm genuinely curious about what your reading habits are. Um. Well, I am uh, super guilty of like, if I see a book that I think that I will like, I will pre-order it and then forget that I've pre-ordered it. And then it'll arrive at my doorstep. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wow. Um, six months ago, me pre-ordered like a Kathleen Hanna's memoir or whatever. Um, I read a bit of everything. So I teach now. Um, and so I read some stuff for that. And then I read some stuff that is like very up my alley, like more like voicey contemporary fiction, um, experimental, introverted, that kind of thing. Um, I've been reading all over the place. I love to read like a, um, like a, a memoir of a person who worked in like the nonprofit sphere or <laughs> like poetry collections when I'm, when I'm, especially when I'm writing something cause they don't compete. Mm -hmm. um, well, they don't compete because I'm not trying to write poetry. <laughs> right, right. No, I totally understand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I read a bit of everything, but I am, I do read a lot of contemporary fiction. So like stuff, that, stuff that's just coming out now. And is that primarily what you teach as well? Um, uh, yes. Although I always try and anchor anything that I'm teaching that's been taught or that's been published in like the last 40 years with something earlier too. Just for like some continuity, you know? Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, and so then um, I, my last real question is, uh, you know, to ask you about your relationship to revision. I, 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 um, I wonder, you know, what the evolution of your revision experience has been. And, you know, if you wanted to mention bookends, you could, you know, but you don't have to, but <laughs> just, um, but I'd be curious about how, how you're thinking about how you revise has changed since college, grad school bookends now. If I could do, well, I know I could do book, bookends again. Uh, <laughs> I would a million times over. <laughs> I just think of it as like the loveliest bubble. And I think bubbles are good and they are not bad. You know, like sure. as soon as bookends was over and I think it's worth mentioning that um, my fellowship year started in I think like May, 2020. So we especially needed like um, to bury our heads in the sand of our novels. Um, 
And then there's so much pressure to, to like take a little segue away from revision. There's so much pressure to like get an agent, get a publishing deal. And when I left grad school, I did the same thing where I was like, I'm not on task. I'm not successful if this doesn't happen for me in six months, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think the older I get, the more I let go of those kinds of timelines because I have, um, I have the track record to realize that as hokey as it sounds, things do happen in the way that they're meant to. Right. Um, they really do. And novels and writing careers, like they can be fast and they can be sort of magic that way, or they can be very slow. And I really don't think that there's any um, benefit to either way, you know, like they're both equal. Um, I think that I've learned a lot from writing two books and revising them. There's so much instinct involved and like faith in your own idea and like in plugging away that it only shores me up to do it again. Um, yeah, I still feel very anxious about the first draft mm -hmm. and maybe the second one. And then in revision, I feel more, even if it's frustrating and sort of confounding, I feel a little bit more um, in control of things, you know? So yeah, one thing that strikes me as I get older um, is like <laughs> sort of how dynamic my writing practice is. Like I'm kind of always trying to trick myself into doing to writing more and like throwing myself curveballs, like, um, and, and there's so much available to you now, like through the writing community that I've gained through bookends and doing an MFA, it's like people holding writing sprints and like, you know, week long sort of like writing adventures. And, um, I need all of that. I need like a pledge to like write so many words and like, so like whatever month, you know, so I'm always kind of, um, just like, trying to stay tapped into like what I need now mm -hmm. and following th through on that impulse. So, so you don't really have like a, a thing, which is, uh, m you know, my revision strategy by me, Nora Dector that, you know, that I could put on a poster on a wall. It's really that, but this, this piece of writing at this time I was asking for this. Yeah, it's like maybe I have like five revision strategies and I'm like, what do I need right now? You know, do I need like my trusted bookends pod mate to have a look at it? Or, um, you know, do I need like to go to a trusted mentor and have them be like, give me some sage advice? Or do I need my butt in the seat for a month working for so many hours a day, yeah. um, which doesn't happen that often. Let's just note that. Um, <laughs> That's pretty fun. But you know, like every yeah. moment and your schedule and what's going on in your life necessitates a different approach, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like, it's so slow writing novels for me. Maybe other people are fast. So like, whatever will get me through the night, you know, like whatever sort of like supportive device. And sometimes I'm like, um, uh, subscribing to like a computer computer program that like blocks out the internet and I need that or sometimes I um I need an arbitrary deadline set by like a, a work exchange partner or something so just like mm -hmm. I find it it's all it's very malleable yeah whatever whatever is needed it's it's funny I will say I I feel as if um you're a person who has very visibly changed in the time that I've known you you're your um i think the the your in, the increase in your confidence has increased the beauty of your work and i i would wish that for everybody that's been a wonderful thing to see that as you as you got more confident about your work your work shows it you know when i think of your very early in grad school work versus now which and it was beautiful then, but it's just there's a different, there's just this different quality, this very, um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, c confidence is not the word. It, it, it's just bigger than there's a, there's a kind of floral quality to it. It's a, there's just something that has, you've really um, grown into your voice and your abilities and wow. So it's just been wonderful to watch. So. 
I do feel like I'm uh, a late bloomer in many things. So hopefully I will only continue to getting better. <laughs> I, I would I would vouch for that. I believe that that will happen. I am absolutely certain. So, yeah. So I think we should um, see if there are other questions for other from other people. But thank you. This has been wonderful. Yeah, what a wonderful conversation. And please, um, everyone who's watching, please feel free to join us with questions. Um, we're here to chat. So, yeah, please. <laughs> Nora, I wanted to ask you, so you said this, the, your, your um, first novel was based on your MFA thesis. Mm -hmm. It grew out of your MFA thesis. And when did you start the second one? Were you working on them around the same, during the same time or was it one and then the next? Um, there was a little spillover for sure. Um, I would say like, so I finished my MFA in 2016 and that's right when this new novel started it's most like nascent ideas um, were born of actually like writing prompts from when I was in grad school. And then after that, it was like uh, two years until the book, my MFA thesis book came out. So it came out in 2018. And right around then is when I think um, I started to work on like this book went through like several evolutions before I found kind of like the main character and um, the voice. Yeah. So it was like two years of writing <laughs> somewhat like um, not pointlessly, however, like uh, just warming up writing before I really like found the story. And then two years after that until book ends. Yeah. Yeah. So it kind oh, of. Just, oh, so it was really four years after graduation that you started book ends. Yes. Although, yeah, but like, I would say like this book, What's Not Mine was very much in the background until 2019 ish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like, um, I started off writing about the, uh, the main character was like the, the bad boyfriend, some boy. And then, and it wasn't going anywhere. It was one of those like dead first drafts where I was pushing in a direction it didn't need to go. I wanted to write in third person. And I was like, I want to write about a man. <laughs> I didn't really. <laughs> um, Turns out you didn't. <laughs> yeah. And then I was like, well, he has this, just he had this like really obnoxious sidekick who kind of commanded attention. And then I was like, well, and I started to write lines that were from her point of view. And that's when it really took off. So it, it took off. And then within like a year and a half, I was in bookends and I was in bookends with like a loose first draft. It had major gaps in it. Um, and then but I was the, but the arc of the story, except for the end was pretty much is pretty much yeah. the same. I didn't know how I would exactly get to the end. The end was kind of there. And then I had a lot of unnecessary stuff in there that like yeah. we learned how to drop, you know? Yeah. 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 So we have a good question online. Sorry. It's just hard to believe now. But yes, sorry. No. Sorry. Sorry. Dad. No, I'm uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah. So we have a question from uh, Jules Dunn. Um, so what is the last YA book you read and how does straight up YA, as opposed to the space your work inhabits, inform or influence your writing? So, um, I'm struggling to remember the name of the last YA book I wrote, I read, but it was about um, a queer relationship and it was really good. Um, and I think that what I draw from YA is that uh, like sort of giving the attention that is due to the teenage perspective, which is ridiculous. However, very interesting. You know, like I really like, um, the overconfidence of a teenager. Like you really don't know what you don't know when you're a teenager, even if you're suffering greatly under like the adults or like the adults in your life or like school. Um, yeah, there is still just so much sort of like false confidence involved in, in being young. And I love the emotional extremes of a teenager as well. So um, I can't say for sure if I will write from the perspective of a teen again, I don't know, but um, I would certainly flash back to the perspective of a teen, even if I have like adult narrators in the future. Yeah, I love the, um, 
I love the emotional extremes of, of a teenager. There's something about learning big lessons for the first time, you know, as you're entering adulthood that is so powerful that I'm always drawn to. Yeah. You know, you make me think that that um, that perhaps that kind of innocence is necessary or naivete is necessary for any character to a certain extent th that you really can't do without it. Yeah. So, yeah. So we have a question from Meg Wolitzer from our co-founding director. Um, Meg writes, hi, Nora, and congratulations again on this wonderful novel. You mentioned first person versus third person. Can you speak to those differences and how you think they make a book feel? Thanks, Meg. Um, I've always been more comfortable in first person, I think, because I need that sort of like, again, hokey but like emotional sort of conduit to the character you know um but I have learned that for me there are modes of first person that feel almost like third person where the narrator can kind of melt away and whether it's like through flashback or the section I read where it's like um Bria the narrator is describing her town which I think she can be more of like a dispassionate observer of, even though they're serious events, you know, that she's talking about. Um, yeah. So I don't, I don't know if I'll ever write in third person and I think that's okay. However, I have embraced like first person pretending to be third person. <laughs> Just taking a look here. Oh, um, I, I was, I was going to just say, I, I think there are third person writers and first person writers. And I, um, there's a, there's a wonderful story that I'm not going to tell correctly about the guy who wrote memoirs of a geisha. Uh, I think I, I've probably said this story to many people who are here before, but that, but that he had um, written the book entirely in the third person and just couldn't quite get it and then wrote it in the first person. And that's the book that became this huge book. And I, I know I don't have the story exactly right, but I do think that for some people in a finding draft, we go from third to first or first to third. And But people really do have their comfort voice, I think in many ways. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'll, I'll pigeonhole myself and say I'll forever be a first person author, but for for now, that's what's felt most right. Do you do you feel as if you're going to um, uh, remain in in? I mean, I think you're going to remain in your issue pocket. Like, I don't think you're suddenly going to write about like high fashion in Hollywood or something. Do you know? Like, I think that the the things that concern you, the um, the issues of of um, being unparented and drugs and um, and uh, uh, resisting the kind of way life is supposed to be. Um, I don't think you're gonna move away from those concerns, but maybe I, maybe you will. I'm, but it just seems like that's your subject matter. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I really like writing that punches you in the heart <laughs> um, and is a little, I mean, yeah, I like, I like to read all kinds of writing and then I like to write one kind of writing, right, but right. yeah, um, we'll see. But yeah, I think that um, I have accepted stylistically that it's okay if there is um, commonalities between, you know, from what I work on to the next thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you feel that that's the same thing with your teaching that you, um, that you like to teach certain, I mean, you said, you know, you mostly teach contemporary fiction, but that is, but is, is, is there a certain kind of book that you want them to know about that that is the book that they, you know, that the kind like are, because those were the books that taught you things. I, I actually think I teach pretty diverse things that aren't necessarily in that pocket of what I most like to read and write. Mm -hmm. And I think in that sense, um, 
like there's always the danger when you're trying to figure out like a writing adjacent career that your writing adjacent career will sort of like um, drain you. And I think in teaching like things that are a little outside my comfort zone or like my, um, my pocket, so to speak, right. it does keep me more tapped into like what other kinds of writing can do. So I teach a lot of um, creative nonfiction. So maybe I'll end up more in that vein. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, and I think in like talking to my students about, I like to sometimes study things that I, not that I don't like, but that maybe challenge my interest, let's say. Um, yeah. So I think teaching is actually like net positive for my, for my writing because of that, because it keeps me interested in like more than one thing. Um, and I talk to my students about like, you don't have to, this doesn't have to be your favorite story, but what can we learn from it? You know? Right. Um, I, I don't know if, uh, if Laura Jenred, your who uh, is, is in the audience today, but, um, but she, she wrote to me earlier today. I hope I'm not taking something away that she wanted to tell you herself that um, she was absolutely certain that she knew who should play Bria in the movie. And um, and I agree with her completely about who this person is. Um, but I wonder if you have ideas about who your characters are as. Um, as not really. Actors. Like, I mean, I, I, I hope she won't be mad at me for telling you this. I would love to know. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really great. Um, I am. Um, Emma Mackey. Who, oh, perfect. I, yes. I mean, she's she's so perfect for. Yes. it's hard to believe actually um in sex education she does like wounded but bra like brazen teenagers as well yeah right yeah yeah so she, i think um, she's your actress so. i actually in my um in my editorial process with my editor she was like what color is bria's hair and i was like i don't actually know <laughs> like, I don't yeah, yeah. A clear you know, i mean you know we know who, what color everyone else's hair is but yeah yeah so that's pretty interesting yeah. so yeah i it, it's that's just um i just thought that was funny i hope she's not mad at me for telling that oh i love that Perfect. yeah yeah i've got actually a note here from laura um who writes, I had the honor of seeing you read an excerpt from this novel in July 2021 at the Southampton Writers Conference bookends session and cross my heart, I mentioned it to someone afterward and noted and lost your name. So. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, <laughs> that's great, yeah. Uh, so we have a couple questions here. Um, I'm actually going to jump to Laura's question and then jump back to one in the queue. Um, so Laura said, I hope this isn't a spoiler, but I have to ask about the bear. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the bear is both like a tie to where I'm from in uh, Manitoba, Canada. And then... <laughs> Uh, when I lived, when I was going to school in Southampton, um, I was driving up the highway on the LIE one day and um, my Manitoba brain thought that I saw like a, a bear's body at the side of the road. And in, I kept driving and it turned out to be um, like a dump truck that had dumped its entire load of like big black garbage bags at the side of the road. And it just reminded me so much of home. <laughs> and um when I was growing up my dad and my uncle once were driving down the highway here and they the same scenario that's in the book where for those who haven't read it um the characters are driving down the highway near the dump and they come upon um a bear that's been hit by a car and they have to decide like how to deal with this so um it was sort of like I was in this writing atmosphere in like a place that's pretty foreign to me and then reminded of home and um, it turns out there's no bears on Long Island. So I don't know what I was thinking, <laughs> but there are bears here and everyone has bear stories here, like bears rattling your tent when you're camping or like on the roof of your cottage or like, you know, when I was a kid, we would literally drive to the dump outside town and just watch the bears like wow. for sightseeing. Yeah. And um, so I was like away from home and feeling I guess, sentimental about that stuff. And that captured my attention. And then I just think that like, 
I think that a minor character in everything that every contemporary novel now is maybe climate disaster. Um, so it felt right to have subtly, you know, like fire, forest fires in the background of, of what's not mine and bears that are coming to town and like raiding the dumpsters and like a minor threat to the characters. And it just sort of like, it adds to all of the, the minor or more like serious threats um, that are circling the characters. And yeah, just also like maybe, I hope all writers do this, but I just throw in things that, that amuse me and that like, comfort me, you know? So um, when I'm living far away from home, like these, uh, these things that remind me of being here and the culture of being here um, are just sort of like pleasant and reassuring. Also all the flies and worms and... <laughs> How many of those? We're just entering worm season here in Manitoba. <laughs> We go from winter to plagues of insects. <laughs> well, we have the garbage bags, but not, not the bears. <laughs> you have your own problems. <laughs> yes, we have our own problems. Yeah. Um, so I'll jump back to Jules Dunn has another question about plotting process. Um, she's wondering, do you feel, do you free write to find the essence of your story? Do you begin with a particular structure or something else? Yes to free writing, um, definitely. And then I find, and I only have like two novels to um, like compare my process to. However, both times I have found um, as I write, it's like my mind is too eager and I'm too much in a hurry. So I'll be like writing something that happens in the first quarter of the book and then something that happens in the final quarter of the book will arise urgently and I will then go to write that and then it becomes kind of like about filling in the gaps in terms of plotting so I don't necessarily outline in like a coherent way <laughs> but I outline in like an incoherent way and then try and fill in the gaps so, so more like a like, like what um, Meg would call a beat sheet or something where just the yeah the exactly bone. I know I need to get to that beat. I just have to figure out how. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh, I see. I I see that I have um I I stepped on Jennifer Jennifer's question without realizing it, but because she also is curious about the worms. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess you guys don't have worms in New York. We do. We do. do you? Your worms are just I mean, what happens to some boy on the way home from when he's walking your home is pretty disgusting. It know, is. We don't have that. And it's just like, that's June in Manitoba. Um, yeah, I literally, it's, it's in the book, but I remember vividly like walking out of my high school to the bus stop and like getting like a gross worm stuck in my like Mac glass lip gloss that was like so super thick and having to pick it off. Um, yeah, if it's not, if it's not, heinously cold here um worms are dropping from the sky or <laughs> mosquitoes are swarming you yeah yeah but you don't have mosquitoes right we do oh um, you have everything <laughs> have uh it's, it's still a thing but they they drive trucks up and down the streets of my city uh fogging in the middle of the night for mosquitoes you have to like close your windows and stuff wow yeah oh so you have yeah. everything <laughs> but we don't have earthquakes and we don't have um hurricanes so <laughs> all right so okay so there's something <laughs> so it's not like full-on plagues just yeah yes yeah. yeah. i mean if you look at the map of like who will be like at a livable temperature for how long we're doing okay here in the middle of the country in canada mm -hmm. so I'll yeah. see you guys in the apocalypse. Yes, we'll be moving up there <laughs> with our ticks and everything else. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh yeah. So you have you have the ticks and the billboards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the garbage bags. So we just have our things. So um do you want to do Miranda's question or yeah. Um so Miranda is wondering, can you talk about the courage it takes to break writing rules in your case the rule that if you're writing about teenagers from a teenage point of view then you're writing YA 
Yes, breaking the writing rules. Um, I think it, it's important to do. I think you, it's such a balancing act though to like write the way you want to write and then start taking others' opinions into it. Um, but two books into my writing career, I think more than anything, I should trust my instincts. Um, I was like looking for a passage to read to you guys today and like reading through. And there was a couple of flashbacks that I had written in present tense experimentally. And I was like, you know, they made me change those, but maybe I should have fought for it. Um, and maybe one day I will. So yeah, I think, like I was saying, there's so much instinct involved in it and so much faith involved in writing. Um, and I really think we should all trust ourselves and trust our guts um, because other people's opinions will come, you know, and you seek them out at a certain point and it's important, um, like mentor opinions and first reader opinions are super important to me. However, um, nothing I've ever written has been any good if I didn't trust myself first and foremost. Um, yeah. So I would, I would just stress the importance of, of that, of having faith in yourself and your instincts and um, you perhaps knowing, well, keeping like that window open for outside opinions that you know better than anyone, like what you are working on, um, at least for like a good long time before you start considering other people's opinions. Yeah, I think trusting that. I think we should all write something to delight ourselves first and foremost, and then think about what other people think and feel, you know? So what you're, you're really just arguing for like the heedless first draft and then yeah. start thinking about it. Absolutely. I yeah. I love that. That's great. That so, might be a perfect place to end. Be, be good. In, I mean, that seems... I loved this. So, I mean, I could go for two more years, but I think for now we should stop and then we'll do it again. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just wonderful to be with you, Nora. And thank you, Jen, for orchestrating. And thank you, everybody, for coming. So thank you, everyone, for being here. And we have two more events coming up next month um, with Eve Gleichman and Laura um, Blackett in conversation with Meg Wolitzer. And then in September, jo Jocelyn Tekex will be joined by Meg once more. So thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. And we'll see you really soon. Thanks, everyone.